Mr. Tony Freeman, how are you, sir? Doing really well. How you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Finally, got to get you on the show, man. We've we've been trying hard to to uh, yeah. get a time and a day, and something happens. Yeah. You know, it's funny is when I messaged you yesterday, I was driving through Atlanta. I was coming back from Tennessee. Oh wow! I said, you know what? Because uh, I knew you had lived in Atlanta. I said, let me message Tony again to see what his schedule is. And you were ready to go right then. I was like, oh, no, man, I'm on my way home. <laughs> uh, well, I kind of stay ready to go. You know, I, yeah. I work from home, so um, I have an office, but I don't have to go there that often. So mm-hmm. I work from home most of the time. So I'm pretty flexible in, you know, when I can pull over or just, like I told you, I'll just stop, drop, and roll and, mm-hmm. and get ready. I do yeah. Zooms all the time uh, with my team. So it's just easy to. Yeah, to well, that's good. Yeah, good. yeah. I just wasn't in a position. I was driving, so oh man, no, I'm good. I'm you know, good. Atlanta, Atlanta traffic's crazy, bro. It's like we moved north, eighty-five north. We were over on the other side off of seventy-five, mm-hmm. and they have a um, HOV and they have Peach Pass now. So mm-hmm. it's like if you don't have that Peach Pass, you can't really, you have no control over how how long it's going to take you to get places. Mm-hmm. So even with the Peach Pass, you still get locked, jammed up, but um without it it's just it's ridiculous wow what brought you to atlanta um in high school i worked construction in 11th and 12th grade Mm -hmm. and the company that i worked for was based out of atlanta so in the summer i would go up to atlanta and work and then come back home for school and then when i graduated they had a federal job at the richard b russell building uh and they were going to pay me like 14 15 bucks an hour or something at you know 17 18 years old so i was like run it so i went to atlanta stayed with my uncle and i liked it so i've been here ever since that was like 84. oh wow now you're originally from uh indiana yep okay and, South Bend. Uh, i grew up like two miles from notre dame oh wow, wow. yeah, I was, yeah big, I, was, I was doing some research on you i was trying to think man are there any other pros from indiana um, my boy is from Indiana. Um, uh, Ed Nunn is from Indiana. He's from okay. Indiana. Yeah. Okay. The only so. person I could think of was Larry Bird for some reason. <laughs> well, we had Larry Bird. We had Adrian Danley, who was less famous. Yeah. Uh, you know, Michael Jackson from Gary, you know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. Now, did you, uh, and we'll get into your career and stuff like that. I just interviewed uh, Quincy Taylor not long ago. Oh, cool. Yeah, I was just reading his, um, the article he wrote, uh, you know how you just end up yeah. finding something or watching something? I think it was YouTube. Yeah. I was watching the YouTube when he was talking about, you know, his career and all that. So Quince is a really cool dude. He One is. of the tall guys along with me. Yeah, yeah. And that's what intrigues me with you guys, because I'm tall. I'm 6'4". Oh, know, wow. And uh, Quincy, you know, he's the same height. I think he was 6'5", actually. Right. Uh, but we got to talking about his training. He was helping me out with my training and um yeah i thought it was pretty cool when i saw your height i'm like oh man he's 6'2 and big frame and you got to do it different yeah yeah it's not it's not totally different i mean Mm -hmm. um but it's different i found that um you know higher rep range more time under tension um controlling the momentum all those things i needed to implement in order to make gains uh you know i tried to you know you know five to six reps this type of stuff it just didn't ever work on me i felt it too much more in the joints yeah. um you know that's why my and, and when i started really developing my shoulders my sets were like you know 30 to 70 reps uh, of just mm-hmm. various movements in one set mm-hmm. uh, just so i can get that more time under tension without having to go super heavy yeah i just uh i also just interviewed milos and he's kind of like those giant sets because mm-hmm. he had so many problems with his knees and stuff like that yeah and uh yeah so and that's and that was my question. You well, first of all, my question is, how did you get the X Man? Who gave you that? So I tried to call myself the X Man, and and it, you know how it is when you try to nickname yourself, it never works. Uh-huh. So when I was working for VPX, right? So VPX Man, you know, and then that's when the movie X Men came out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I was trying to be the VPX Man, and, mm-hmm. and nobody was really paying attention to it. And so when I won the Iron Man in 07, actually before that, in 06, uh, I won the Europa. And then uh, after I won the Iron Man in 07, Steve Blackman approached me and he was like, hey, let's do a, 
a shoot, you and pair, I want to cover shoot and I want to, you know, accentuate your X frame, right? And so we did, you know, two days, eight hours. I mean, it was like 16 hour photo shoot, I mean, you know, two, two eight hour days. And, and so the first day we were kept trying all these shots and I was just like, you know, pair, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? What are we looking for? And he was like, well, I'm trying to find something uh, for the um, cover you know, accentuating, accentuating your X-frame. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I jumped up on the, the seated dip and chin and then, you know, grabbed the bars. I was like, take this picture. And he took the picture and, and that was the cover. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but it, it's, it stuck after that because he, six months in a row, he was like, you know, the X-Man training or whatever, just whatever it was he did. It was like six months, six issues in a row. And so after that, everybody started calling me X-Man. Oh, okay. Now, do you watch, uh, we were talking about Palumbo before. You you watch his shows, speaking of Blackman. Um, well, you know, <laughs> Dave is my dude. Dave is the one that really um, took me there conditioning-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Aponte is the guy that helped me get over 300. And we did well conditioning-wise. And then I got with Dave right after that. He was like, T, if you, if you really dial in your conditioning, you could do some damage. And so that's when I started working with him in 07. And uh, so we got really close. Me and Dave, we we done a lot of shows. I had the most success working with him. Yeah, he's a good guy. Let me uh, let's see. I pull your screen up here. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. That's a good shot of you there. That's um, that's at the 08 Olympia. That was after nine shows that year so 07 olympia i got sick um probably i think it was like thursday um you know when we started the drying out process mm -hmm. that just didn't go well and i was already sick before that but you know it wasn't like it wasn't keeping me from competing it didn't really affect me but when you combine the two um it just took me over the edge and i wasn't able to recover i ended up competing um, but you know, they were, because I won the first two shows of the year, they were kind of taught me as being a threat, you know, that year at the Olympia and I kind of screwed it up. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Dennis that Wolf, you know, was, was there and took advantage of that, you know, um, another tall guy. So that was cool. And then, um, yeah, I like this picture here. Yeah. And then, so this was, uh, I think this was, that was 2012, the year mm, of yep. So mm -hmm. in this show, it was weird because. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, of course I recognized the physiques and I had heard of Sean, Dave told me about him, mm -hmm. but, um, I didn't really, I saw him compete at the Arnold, I think that earlier in that year and, uh, I think somebody else won, but I thought he was, I thought he should have won. But anyway, when we, when we met at that show, um, I went more for conditioning and I probably should have came in a little fuller at that show. And then, um, you know, try to dial it in for the next one. So uh, mm -hmm. that was a great show for Sean. Of course, he went on to do great things. And um, so yeah, that was that was a good moment. That's that's when Roley really came up came on too. So yeah. Now uh, you started out late. You started in your thirties. It said. Competing. Yeah, I started bodybuilding at twenty one. Well, started lifting at twenty one, mm -hmm. and I started competing right away. Just at, at the AAU, you know, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did a bunch of shows, but I didn't prepare for them. I was just, you know, I was naturally, I was ectomorph, so I was naturally lean. So I would just jump in shows and I would either win or top three or whatever. And I just did that for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Junior America, I think it was, AAU, and competed against some real bodybuilders. And that was very humbling. And so I decided, you know, I'm not going to get on stage haphazardly. I'm going to really figure this thing out. And so um 91 is when i started lift taking serious lifting serious so i started you know trying to eat trying to diet halfway mm -hmm. and um, i got with a guy named harold hogue actually i call him my cousin now because we got so tight during that time but um he's the one that introduced me to intensity mm -hmm. and i never forget it. he was he was my coach and we didn't count reps or sets and i, I never let go of that we all did everything by stopwatch so he had a stopwatch and he would put some weight on the bar or whatever, and he'd be like, go. And, <laughs> and he, just boy, go. I, he really took me to places I'd never been. And my body responded tremendously. And um, I went from, you know, the low 200s to, you know, 250. 
and then of course I, I was hooked mm -hmm. after that. So mm -hmm. that that took me on my trek. And I mean, all the stretch marks that I got on my whole body, I got them during that period because I, I mean, I, I literally um, put on a lot of muscle in a short period of time. Yeah. So you found that you you put on a lot of muscle without having to go super heavy. Well, yeah, like I say, because my limbs are so long and I wasn't really super strong anyway. Certain things I was strong. I can do chins all day and I can squat all day, but I wasn't great at a leg press. Um, you know, definitely wasn't good at any of the pressing movements. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, kind of, I, I bought all the books. You know, when I first started lifting, we only, we only had books. There was no internet. So you either learn directly from somebody or you read the book. So I bought all the bodybuilding books, high intensity bodybuilding um, advanced bodybuilding techniques, all those books. And I read them all from cover to cover, pretty much tried everything, Bulgarian um, strength or power routine, all those things from back in the day. And um, and so I kind of like developed my own little way of doing things because there weren't a lot of tall guys. You had Paul Dillette, you had, um, you know, just a couple of people to, to emulate. And um, I wasn't strong like them. So I, I didn't, I didn't try to Follow him. When I did try to follow someone, um, it was Dorian Yates in 95. I did a Dorian Yates workout. Uh, it just came out in the magazine. I went to the gym and tried to do his workout and tore my pec. So after that, I stopped following everybody. Yeah, I, I, um, I saw that somewhere where you actually waited several years before you got that pec fixed, right? Yeah, well, so my, mine was a partial tear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time, it wasn't a very popular surgery. Yeah. Uh, I, got, so, I got a zipper right here. Same yeah. thing. So the doctors that I talked to was almost afraid to do it. And um, four and a half years later, my my workout partner, partner who was actually my physical therapist, mm -hmm. he came in the gym one day saying, hey, I met this. We got this new doctor in our group that um, says he can fix your pet. And I was just like, man, don't play with me. You know, I've been dealing with this shit for, you know, four and a half years. And uh, he said, no, you should go talk to him. So I went and talked to him and he told me that he had fixed one of the guys in the NFL who tore the fascia, which they say that's unrepairable. So he said the, the muscle burst out of the fascia mm -hmm. and he had to stuff it back in there and sew it up. So he said, if I can fix his, I know I can fix yours. And, mm -hmm. and so we did the surgery and, you know, I woke up from surgery ready to, ready to, you know, be a bodybuilder again. And, um, you know, long story short, you know, the rest is history. I kind of, it took me a while to come back. Um, Cause it had say been- how much weight, how years. much weight did you lose? I was about 240. Okay. I'm about 240 right now. So okay. Okay. I guess this is my, this is my me mm -hmm. with, without any kind of training or dieting or anything like that. Cause I, I had went back to 240, back 242, I think was when, what I weighed when I got my surgery. Mm -hmm. And I probably weigh about two. 40 right now 239 something like that my goal is to be 235 but in shape so um i invented my own workout equipment and i, I don't know if i'm gonna release the equipment to, um but i'm gonna start working on it here in 30 days i should have it have it here so i'm gonna start playing around with that and we'll see what it does okay and, um, and i'll take it from there yeah now what was your what was your heaviest off season and what was your heaviest co competition weight the heaviest off season, I got up to 323. And that was um wow. When was that? So the year the Nationals was in in Atlanta, um, I actually got a picture of it. Me, Dave Palumbo was interviewing me, him and um oh my God, I keep forgetting everybody's names now. Was but anyway, the early two thousands, maybe or late. Yeah, it, it was. It, it was early two thousands. And um maybe and it was here in Atlanta. And the guy with the big biceps won. We have I haven't heard nothing since since. And he wasn't even, I'm trying to think was even American. But anyway, that's the guy who won. Mm. And Dave was interviewing me. I had this gold shirt on and some jeans. But anyway, I was in that picture, I was like 321, something like that. Mm -hmm. And what was your heaviest competition? My you? heaviest con con competition. Um I'd have to say on stage was probably the, the 2006. Mr. Olympia, I was like 285. Um, I was 293 in 09. But I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I burst my bursa sac uh, at the right before the um, right before the athletes meeting on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I was, man, I was oh my god, <laughs> I, I, that was like 
the craziest I ever looked. Everybody said 08 was the craziest I ever looked, but 09 probably Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday was the craziest I ever looked in my life. It was it was mm-hmm. insane. And um, I bust my bursa sack on my way to the event. And of course, there's no really treatment for that. They give you, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, ibuprofen and ice. Well, I never take ibuprofen. I mean, mm-hmm. I've maybe taken ibuprofen two or three times in my life. I, I, I only remember one. <laughs> I'm sure it's more than one, but mm-hmm. it was that night and um, it just destroyed. I, I was My gut was all jacked up and I couldn't eat anything else. I literally, the meal that I had in my stomach, I stayed full all the way until like Sunday or Monday. It was, that was, it was like, that was horrible. That was a horrible weekend. Oh, wow. And um, that's the year J1. That's the best we ever seen J. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, I think if I didn't burst my, bust my burst attack, that would have probably been the best Tony Freeman they've ever seen. But, you know, uh, only, only me and a couple of people that was at, in my hotel got to see that. Cause I was like 293. I walked into the, um, I walked into the athletes meeting. So that was on Wednesday. And I walked in the door and Jim Manning was standing at the door and he was like, damn, Tony, how much you weigh? And I was like, I'm 293. He was like, because I was doing, you know, a year before I was like, you know, 270 maybe, 270. I remember Friday, Saturday morning, I woke up at 261. And then that night I was like 278, but I, I literally ate all day Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I went and did a colonic that morning. And I ate literally all day, didn't drink a drop of water. And I just kept filling out, and um, that's why I looked so good on stage that night. But um, but yeah, that was that was <clears> oh <throat> nine was was a sight to see. Just I just never made it to stage with it. Yeah, because you got fifth. What oh eight? You got fifth. Oh eight, I got fifth. Oh nine, yeah. I think I got. I think mm-hmm. it was like eighth, something like that. Yeah, oh, you no. got eighth in there. Yeah, yeah. So. But man, even to get so you were thinking in, in 09, you should have gotten gotten higher. Well, no, I, uh, well, if I had, if I didn't bust my bursa sack, I bust your I bursa sack, yeah. a package that would have kept me in the top five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what I, I mean. You what know, do you I, think you, you know, what do you, what do you actually think you would have placed? What do you feel like you would have placed? Well, I mean, they gave Dexter third. So fourth mm-hmm. was probably fourth or fifth was probably the best I could have mm-hmm. hoped for. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that was probably the best branch we ever seen as well. So I don't know, should have, would have, could have, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? But all I know is 290, you know, dry and peeled without busting the bursa sack uh, would have been would have been right on up there. So I got pictures still where you, you know, I mean, it definitely didn't look like I got eighth place. But yeah. once I bust my bursa sack and, and, and my, my conditioning started to wane, I just was like, you know, now I'm just going to go up there and do my best because I already know that. Yeah. I already knew that I was being judged you know, against myself. So if I didn't look better than I did in 08, then, you know, it wasn't going to be. Dexter looked way better than he did in 08, in 09. Way, way better. And he won 08. Yes, and he won 08. So he got third in 09. So what does that tell you? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, me and Dexter was backstage and I was already dejected because I bust my bursa sack. And so Dexter was looking a little solemn. And I was like, what's wrong, bro? So he peeled off and I, and I dude, I was in awe. I mean, I was in awe. He was like, it was like velvet. It's, it was crazy, bro. <laughs> it was crazy. I, mean, I can't even really put it into words. Mm-hmm. And he was sad and I was just like, what's wrong? And he was like, he knew he wasn't gonna win. And I was just like, damn, that's, mm-hmm. ooh, I, don't, I, 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 was, I felt, he made me feel better. I didn't mm-hmm. feel as bad. Cause see, I'm mm-hmm. telling you, he, 09 Dexter Jackson was unbelievable on Friday night. So he should have had a repeat. I mean, what? like I said, that's the best Jay Cutler we ever seen. I think mm-hmm. if Jay had have been better the year before, then Dexter would have got second and Jay would have won. Yeah. So I can't really say Dexter should have deserved a repeat. I'm just saying he looked better and got third. So mm-hmm. call it what, call it what yeah. you want to call it. It was just the timing. You know, Jay, that was the best Jay we've seen since 01. Um, you know, and so I won't say Dexter got a gift, but he got an opportunity in, in 08 and then Jay got an opportunity in 09, you know, to, to get it back. So this That's is a business and, you know, a lot of times we as contestants and fans, we want it to go one way and, you right. know. No, I've been there. I know. Yeah. So yeah, we've all, everybody that's competed, we've all been there. Yeah. It's just, you know, <clears throat> we want to get beat by the person that's the best that day. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so that's never going to change. Mm -hmm. And then you got the business side. So yeah, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Now it says you did over 81 shows. Yeah. I, I, um, that's a lot. I lost count. So my, this is what happened to me when Milos told me he had the record for 72. Once I got to 73, I really stopped. Counting. <laughs> so me, Dexter and Johnny Jackson all have over 73. So Dexter got the most, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and Johnny got the second most, and I got the third most. Uh, I, you know, they outlasted me. Mm -hmm. Dexter turned pro in '97, I think, and then Johnny turned pro in '99. Of course, I'm already five years, four years older than Dexter, and I don't know how many years older than Johnny I am. So again, mm -hmm. I should have been, or should have, would have, could again. But '95 uh, through 2000, I was gone. 2002, I was gone. So that would have gave me another seven years of competing. Mm -hmm. which you know i would have had you know quite a few more shows under my mm -hmm. belt i could have came back in 96 or 97 or whatever i was just so dejected because i had the peck tear and the year before um i pretty much got blackballed and i i didn't even make the top 15 at the nationals which you know i knew i knew something was afoot then and <laughs> so that's why i just was like fuck bodybuilding mm -hmm. i'm out of here and then when i got my peck fixed you know, I was like, well, I want to, I want to at least be a bodybuilder again. I didn't know what the, what the cards held for me to compete. And then, um, I think it was 2000. I saw, I saw Jim Mannion in the, in the basement and we were in Atlanta had the, uh, well, I think 2000, the, the nationals wasn't in Atlanta. That might've been 99 then or 2001, mm -hmm. 99. I think it was, um, the nationals in Atlanta and Jim Mannion was like, told me to come on back. And so once I, once I got my pec fixed, I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go back and see what's up. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, "Man, you can't come back. You you ain't done it in five years." And I was like, "Well, they told me I couldn't do it in the first place, so I'm gonna at least give it a shot." Mm -hmm. And so, 2001, I got eighth place after being gone for four years, or I think it was five years, whatever. And I was like, "Shit, I can." So I made a vow that night, and when I got eighth place, mm -hmm. I said, "I'm winning this next year." And so I was on a mission from pretty much that moment. Yeah. So and people don't realize, especially with you and a anybody that competed in the early 2000s to get in the top 10 anywhere was phenomenal because the, the competition level was just crazy so my first nationals was 93 oh so michael francois was first mm -hmm. dennis newman was second um edgar fletcher was third um don long was fourth i mean you know i'm saying like oh wow yeah um, that's a big lineup yeah, um, Dean Caputo was fifth, mm -hmm. and um, Dean's sponsor was, I think, uh, what was it, Universal one of them, but he, his sponsor was the title sponsor, so he was going to be in there no matter what. And then I got sixth place. And um, so I was just like, you know what? I think I can, I can do something with this. Then I got fourth the year after that and fourth the year after that, and then didn't make the top 15, and I was just like, this is retarded. So anyway, I just got had a bitter taste in my mouth and and uh stopped training um you know couldn't get my pec fixed mm -hmm. so i went into this whole depression spiral and um and then like i say when i when i was able to get my pec fixed i kind of got a little spark and then i didn't realize how hard that was going to be you know after i got it fixed um i had already learned how to train with it torn mm -hmm. um but then i wanted to start really training with intensity so that was a whole nother you know a whole nother level of physical therapy but i was able to pull it off in uh in 2002 but as soon as i turned pro everybody was like well he got to be you need to be 300 pounds to be competitive and i was 250 i turned pro at 249 so that that started a whole you know long journey of mm -hmm. how am i going to be competitive i'm already 36 mm -hmm. years old actually 37 at my first year of pro I was 37 years old so most I mean, not now, but most pro athletes and other sports are, re are reti that's retirement age. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. That's what sent me down the whole trail of, um, you know, longevity and health and wellness and all that with my bodybuilding. So mm -hmm. I knew that I had to figure out a way to last long. I took that, got that from Sean Ray. Sean Ray was able to do 13 Mr. Olympias in a row. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't, you don't accomplish that chasing other bodybuilders. So Sean found his his niche and he mm -hmm. stayed in his, you know, in his zone and that, that equaled longevity. And so 
you know, I did, I did want to be competitive. Um, and towards the end of my career, I kind of put my foot down and was like, you know what, I'm, I'm competing. I'm bodybuilding for me now. And that's when my, my, my started getting smaller because no one was focusing on the classic physique. It turned into mm -hmm. a freak show. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, damn, there's, there's no one that looks like the guys did when I first started doing it left in the sport. It was, you know, you had Dexter, you had Sean, you had me, you know, very few people. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to hold on to that. Um, I, they call it the dark side. I don't want to go over to the dark side. So, um, yeah. that's why I do what I did. What, um, and, and we won't talk about too much, but the depression part that you talked about, Oh yeah, I would love to talk about that because I know a lot of people are. Yeah, busy. and I was going to ask you what, what do you think? Because as bodybuilders and athletes and stuff, we've all probably experienced it. What do you think put you into the depression, and what helps you get out of it? Well, first of all, bodybuilding is like a drug, or it is a drug, or whatever. So the endorphin rush that you get from bodybuilding is hard to replace. There's not too many things in this world that can replace or or you know, that feeling, One, you know, and I know a lot of people who've been in, in really good shape and that whole uh, ceremonial process to get like that, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. to, when you start, when you can't do that anymore, and, but I'm sure it's just like that with all other sports, but bodybuilding, you know, you could, you could do as an older person, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of masters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you come in, in your mind where, you know, you feel like if I don't stop doing this, then I'm going to be harming myself. You know, some people never get there and you, and they end up, it takes them out. Yeah. But me, you know, when you have a family and, you know, first of all, in order for me to continue competing, I had to stop training to heal, to have a chance to come back. So when I, when I embraced the whole healing part, once I, once the doctor told me, he said, listen, you're very deficient in a lot of nutrients required for healing. So you're not going to heal and while you're prepping. It's just not going to happen. You, I said, but I eat eight, you know, seven meals a day. He's like, he said, I'm trying to tell you. So once I succumb to that and realize that I'm going to have to sit down, you know, and, and take my time. So that's a mental situation to deal with. Anyway, I can't even really go to the gym. And I tried, but even sitting on the equipment was uncomfortable. So I was like, you know, let me just obey the doctor. And so I started on this whole cleansing thing because I, you know, number one, I couldn't, wasn't going to eat seven meals a day if I wasn't training. That's, you know, that's, there's no need. So anyway, that whole process and the depression for me, I was in denial because I wasn't really depressed. It was more, um, I felt lost. I didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, I did, like you say, 80, 80 something. I didn't even know that many pro shows. So once I got in that zone, I stayed in that zone for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And so when I mm -hmm. couldn't even train, much less compete, I was just lost. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so, well, when I couldn't train, I also couldn't perform, you know. And then the way that I left the IFBB, which to me, I was just going on to the next thing. But, you know, a lot of people misconstrued that as me, you know, turning my back on the IFBB, whatever. So in other words, I couldn't even go back. So I felt really lost at that point. So I was like, well, what am I going to do? And so I was on this journey to, to kind of be enlightened and to figure out what am I going to do next? Mm -hmm. And so I started, um, you know, fasting. I started, I was praying a lot. I was, you know, you know, just eating all of just healthy foods and just coming up with ways to make myself feel better. And it worked. It, it started when I started purging these toxins, because you got to realize I got diagnosed with kidney worms or worm or, you know, parasite, mm. liver parasites, liver flukes. I had basically dirty blood, which pretty much all bodybuilders do. It just comes from eating all that food. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of things to deal with. I was, you know, had a lot of nutritional deficiencies. So the, the um, emotion part didn't even really affect me as much as the physical once i started overcoming a lot of the physical the emotion part kind of melted away but i started supplementing with um nootropics nootropic coffee actually mm -hmm. and that was very subtle because i'm a coffee snob so i started drinking this nootropic coffee and i and that be before i knew all about the coffee it, it started making me feel better so i was like what is what is in this so anyway the coffee stimulated dopamine and serotonin and endorphins. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, ah, oh. so it took me a long time, but I put two and two together that the endorphin rush that I got from training, I was getting from this coffee. Not yeah. the same, but it was enough to make it okay. Yeah, and, enough, um, to so that, enough to balance you out. Yeah, so that saved me from going down the dark hole. Mm -hmm. And then when I started, you know, getting healthier, I basically, you know, the the when you when you Google kidney worm, it's not pretty. You know, it's like they either take your kidney or you figure out how to kill it. So my right. mission was like, how do I how do I kill these parasites? And I started learning about um, how you know the environment that we create through mm -hmm. that lifestyle mm -hmm. is the perfect environment for parasites and and um, disruptive microbiome. And um, so I started doing the opposite of that. And like I said, I learned a whole bunch of stuff and I started sharing it with other people to make sure that, you know, I, what I thought I was discovering was true and it is. And um, so that's, I kind of been on that whole mission ever mm -hmm. since. Mm -hmm. And so being a bodybuilder, we're always trying to achieve something. We all, you know, we call goal getters and, and all that. And in the real world, um, you probably, you kind of need to be more of a servant. You kind of need to, you know, look out for the people around you, especially if you have the wisdom and knowledge and experience that they don't. Mm -hmm. um, the universe is almost, uh, you know, how they say, with, with great power comes great responsibility. So when you start learning stuff like this, it's your duty to share it with others. So I started focusing my attention on doing that mm -hmm. and start helping, you know, I've been, I help a lot of soccer moms and, you know, regular Joes, you know, with weight loss and, you know, depression and, um, you know, mm -hmm. different type two, by all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's very rewarding because, you know, they're not like us. They're not regimented. They don't know how, they don't know that, you know, 12 weeks of training plus, plus food and th this equals greatness. You know what I'm saying? Or, or mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve. They don't understand that that process is a must. You have to go through that process in order to expect to achieve those kind of results. So anyway, I'm able to put that in layman's terms because, you know, I did it for so many years and that turned into a very, um, lucrative, flourishing business that I actually make money, but I actually coach people for free. So I know that's kind of a weird mm -hmm. concept, mm -hmm. but if you start earning, start understanding some of the universal laws and the biblical principles, like um, the law of receiving, uh, is basically the sower and the seed. So when you plant seeds, mm -hmm. and you know the soil is is going to determine the soil is your intent. So when you plant seeds you, you, with the right intent, your harvest is guaranteed. So I started living that because I experienced it and it worked. And I was just like, well, that is the opposite of what I've been programmed to think. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I embraced that. And, yeah. um, and it's just, it's turned into a wonderful experience. And that's why I don't really, I don't hate the game. I'm still a fan of bodybuilding. Um, you know, I went through a little period where I was just pissed off at the world, but that was just my perception of the world and once i changed my perception of the world mm -hmm. and i detoxify all those demons i finally i literally saw that kidney worm pass out of my body it freaking mm -hmm. blew my mind mm -hmm. and so you know like I, yeah, now i great. know you know that i'm that i'm healed of that at least <laughs> yeah um, we're constantly bombarded with parasites so you know no one you can't avoid it so what happens is your immune system keeps them at bay um for as long as it can and then after that you know they take over so that's what really aging and dying is it's just the microbiome that we pick up through our mm -hmm. entire lives finally wins the battle so yeah and uh you know speaking of helping people that's why i started this podcast i know I, i'm in my 40s now i'm getting towards the end of my bodybuilding mm -hmm. career and stuff and, and it, i just love sharing y'all stories man especially you guys from the 90s and 2000s stuff like that mm -hmm. it's just you, you just don't believe the my my crowd, the people that watch my show, don't really know a lot about bodybuilding. Well, they don't. They're they're starting to learn it. Right. And I guarantee you, when I post your show, I'm going to put a your bodybuilding picture on. I'm going to get all kinds of responses, and people are going to say, "Oh my god, this guy's amazing! I had no idea who he was." And that's what I love to hear. And that's like Quincy. Even Quincy was like, "I don't know why anybody would want to interview me." And when oh, he wow. told his story, and you know, he was in you know Planet of the Apes and all these other movies and all these competitions he did six foot five, 315 pounds. Mm -hmm. The, the response, you just the people that tell me, you know, Oh my God, what an amazing guy, you know? That, and, and, life. Yeah. And that's my paycheck is just to hear people say that, you know what I'm saying? I got a funny Quincy, Quincy Taylor story. Okay. So the 06, um, Europa, Dallas Europa, 
And this was the first time I ever worked with Anthony Aponte. So uh, let me see, what's the show I did before Dallas? Hmm. Oh, six. Oh, so September, uh, so we did, I did the uh, Arnold. San Francisco? Yep, yep, so I did the Arnold, then the San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember what I weighed then, uh, but me and Aponte started working together. And he brought me in really nice uh, for the 06 Ironman, but I got like sixth place. You know, Lee Priest won, David Henry got second. Um, I can't remember who got third, fourth, but I got sixth place. It was, I was like, oh. I mean, you, if you go back and look at the results, but anyway, yeah, that's yeah, when I really right. understood that I was in some kind of political BS and I didn't know it. And so 06 um, Europa, <clears throat> me and, uh, me and Aponte, we go there, you know, I, I mean, I really, I really dug deep in my training because um, at the San Francisco, that San Francisco, that was the first time they ever called me out. Like I had been competing before 04 and earlier 05 and I had mm -hmm. never really got a call out with anybody in the top five. So that's the first time. Yeah, no, it we is. Had, yeah. We had symmetry round and then muscularity round back in the day. So the symmetry round, I didn't get called out at all. And then uh, Aponte told uh, Weinberg, he was like, man, when y'all go look, look at my boy? And he was like, who's your boy? He was like, Tony Freeman was like, oh. So they called me out and then I ended up, in, I, think, I think I got whatever, six or seven, whatever it was, but that's the first time they really looked at me against someone else, you know, like Gustavo, um, Branch and all them. So the Europa, mm -hmm. I go to Europa and, you know, Aponte, I go, go stay with Aponte and Aponte takes me from, 285 to 310, 315, something like that. And then we brought it back in to like in the mid 280s. I think I was about 280. So anyway, we go to the show at the at the Europa in the morning for prejudging. And, you know, back in the day, I don't know if they still do it or not, but we used to all play psych psychological games and <laughs> it wasn't really on our level. Ronnie used to do it to everybody all the time. Like, you know, everybody be back there pumping up, warming up, oiling up and shit. And then he'll just come back in there a little bit late and then peel off and then everybody be wanting to get dressed. <laughs> so so I could that, that year, <laughs> um, that year, uh, I overdid it on, on the diuretics. That morning I woke up, I mean, it was bad too. And so I was so pissed because I kept tired of get, kept you know, you screw yourself up at the last minute trying to make it better. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't never say, okay, this is as good as it's going to get. Let me just ride this out. It's always, every moment until the show's over, we're trying to, <laughs> trying to make it better. Even backstage mm -hmm. with the carving up and all that crap. So anyway, woke up that morning, pretty flat, couldn't really eat. And um, so I called my boy. I said, Jay, Jay Hammett. I called him. I said, hey, man, bring me my, bring me my Vitargo bring me my NO shotgun and a gallon of water. And he was like, what you gonna do with that? I was like, I'm about to drink that shit. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, bro, I said, cause I'm flat and I'm pissed off cause I'm in crazy shape and I can't even hardly flex. So he brings it to me and I mixed the concoction. You gotta understand I had been using this the whole prep. So it wasn't like it was gonna be some foreign substance to shock mm -hmm. my body. So anyway, I started sipping on that and man, I filled out real nicely, real nice. So I put on my clothes, we go to the show, and um, everybody's uh, sitting around in the crowd, you know. And so I, I go in the bathroom, and I and I'm in there pumping up, and I peel off because I'm feeling I'm feeling myself getting pumped. Mm -hmm. I peel off, and I'm pumping up in the in the mirror. And then Quincy Taylor walks in the back. He comes around the corner. We're in a little little auditorium. He comes around the corner, and he sees me in the mirror, and he was like, "Oh, damn." He said, I got to take a dump. So he goes back in there and he's <laughs> bathroom. And so I was like, man, what's wrong with him? Me and my boy, we crack up laughing because I know what he, <clears throat> I know why he was tripping because I was looking crazy. Uh -huh. So I put my warm-up suit back on and I, and I got full-blown pump now and I walk out to, the, to every, where everybody is and everybody, you know, it was like 20 minutes. So everybody jumps up and starts getting dressed and I peel off my shit and everybody stopped and they looked at me like, damn. And then I just got that feeling in my head. And um, I got straight ones at that show. It was it was a really mm -hmm. incredible situation because, like I said, I woke up that morning, you know, like, it, like I wasn't even going to really be able to compete. Wow. And those little tricks that you learn about your own body, um, it allowed me to come away with the victory. Well, anyway, that's the first time I ever came out as the executioner. So I had this whole outfit made um, with these breakaway pants and the executioner hood and this axle out. 
So I'm getting ready to walk on stage to do my performance and Quincy's sitting there he's like, who the fuck is that up under that mask? And I pulled up the mask like, you know who it is. <laughs> so that was just a really cool uh, uh, Quincy story. But yeah. um, I know I went the long way to tell you, tell it to you, but it, it uh, that was real crazy. That's the first time I ever competed against. You had Kai Green, Dennis Wolf, King Kamali. I mean, that show was stacked. Go back and look at that. That show was that's, yeah, cool. yeah, I remember. And I, you know, and I was a, I was a newbie, kind of a nobody. And um, that's when everybody really mm -hmm. um, started calling me the X-Man after that. So who was your, like, I don't want to say rivalry, but who did you want? Like, I, like you're like, I want to beat this guy. Did you have anybody? I mean, to be honest with you, I wanted to beat everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. it wasn't like I... It wasn't like I want to beat him or him or him. Mm -hmm. um, I'm okay, six two, right? So you gotta say I had the peck there, but without the peck, right? Without the peck there, being six two, you know, two eighty five, two ninety, with those kind of proportions, mm -hmm. I would have really been able to to make my upper body match my lower body because you gotta say I had to stop training legs for two years. Almost when I say training them, all I did was leg extensions, leg curls, you know isolation movements for almost two years for my upper body to catch up mm -hmm. so without the peck tear i would have had a much thicker upper body and um you know that so i still had that mentality even though i had the peck tear so my goal was to, to you know like my goal when i in the, in the um in the in the um in the OA at olympia you know my goal at the OA at olympia i was like i want to scar the judges retinas i don't even want them to be able to see nobody else after i walk out you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that was my mentality. That was my attitude. But again, you know, I I could have I could have been better, but I think the peck just that's actually why I stopped training in the first place because I I couldn't see me building a, a a totally symmetrical physique with that situation going on. I was able to hide it in my posing, but you know, when it came down to it, everybody as, mm -hmm. and rightfully so, you know, said, "Well, no, he has a peck there." So. You know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, I never don't really know. But all I know is I went from uh, 201 pounds, you know, at probably about 12% body fat. And, you know, I, I did I did a few things and it was cool. Mm -hmm. And I kept my waist tight. You mm -hmm. know, at my best, I was 306 with a 31 and a half inch waist. You know, a lot of people, you know, they talk about um, exaggerating on measurements and all that type of stuff. Well. One day I was in Boise, Idaho, and um, bodybuilding.com rolled up on me with the camera and with a tape measure. And it was like, you always talking about, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they made me measure my, my waist on camera, and it was like 32 and a half at mm -hmm. about 310. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, you know. It, wow, it, that's crazy. We was, able to, we was able to do some things. I learned so much, and, and, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it differently. Um, it's only because you just learn so much about the body. And, um, you know, that, you know, less is more, you know what I'm yep. saying? Uh, the longer you do this sport, the better you get. It's not how fast you can get big or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like a real journey. And if you do it the right way, you can come out on the other side whole. You know, I kind of went in, I went into the game with a torpedo, you know. So I feel, I consider myself coming out whole. The little soft tissue injury that I had, um, when I left the sport, it, it's not affecting my life at all. It was just, mm -hmm. I needed to be still. I needed to not be squatting 315 for sets of 15 so it could heal. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. so, and if you don't train like that, then you can't be competitive. Mm -hmm. And so it was just that, that perfect storm with me. Um, I didn't have a sponsor, you know, I was 49 and a half. <laughs> my, I wanted to just finish the year at 50, you know, retire at 50. Mm -hmm. you know hopefully qualify for the olympia and just kind of go out like dexter and johnny was able to do mm -hmm. and then when i couldn't do that you know all my money went away so march of 16 you know i made a couple of dollars uh in the show and I, you know i had some gigs and all that but as soon as i wasn't able to train then all you know i had five or six ways of making money they all went away back to back to back to back and i ended up you know luckily my wife loves me and she made sure i was okay but it was a very humbling experience to get that low and try to have to figure out, you know, what am I going to do next? You know, I had, you know. What was your last time, show? Uh, the Arnold Classic 2016. 2016. So 
at what point I last place that's the yeah, first yeah, say what was your what was your point to where you said okay I, i'm done so i've never gotten last place in anything in my history not not even playing you know racing kids in the playground yeah. i've never finished last in anything and so that year is the year that they said that we're going to start judging the posing round because um, they, you know, they wanted to bring back meaning to the sport or whatever. I said, well, you know, at least I'll be able to do well in the posing round. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, they didn't really, we don't have a symmetry round. You know, it's, it's just, it's just, I don't even know what they call it now. But mm -hmm. anyway, my mentality was, let me focus on my posing. I'm a, you know, I, and I had the injury already. So, you know, my leg was swelling up two or three times. This left leg was, you know, <clears throat> half times the size of the right leg. So I was having to do cryo just to get rid of the inflammation and the water retention. And uh, so I barely was going to compete, but I was able to pull it off and went to Poland, did the Arnold. And then that night I'm sitting on the bed, you know, trying to figure out what I'm, if I'm going to go out to eat. My buddy comes in the room and he was like, man, they gave you last place. And I was like, that's impossible. What do you mean I got last place? I, I mean, what do you mean? And so when that sunk in, and then of course I couldn't even stand up and walk at that point. And so I was just like, man, this is, this is the end of the road for me mm -hmm. as far as wanting to do it. I'm standing on stage. You know, I got no sponsor. And you got all the sponsors of all the athletes that are standing next to me on the front row. I was mm -hmm. like, this ain't going to go good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, the guy on the right side of me was 21. And the guy on the left side of me was 24. And then another guy over here was 26. And yeah. I was just like, uh, I'm there, oh, my son is older than them. It's, you know, it's time for me to, to you know step on out the game and uh, like I say that that whole I wanted to I wanted to retire in 2013 you know after the Arnold with Dexter got Dexter won and, and Pac-Man got second I got third I, I wanted that to be my last year then the, the next year when I got uh 14th at the Olympia that's when I really wanted to be done and um a friend of mine talked me into coming back and I you know I stayed for a little while longer but I was I was kind of ready to go in fourteen. Yeah, do you miss it? Uh, no, no. I don't, I don't, is there, is there any? Is there anything about what was your? If you had a favorite part of bodybuilding? Oh, I love performing. Performing. I love performing for the fans. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I miss. I guess I miss that feeling a little bit, but knowing what it takes to get like that, erases. You know what I'm saying? Like. In other words, I'm, I don't have any visions of grandeur that I could, you know, because I'm completely healed right now. I'm, I'm, you know, if you check my blood work, I'm totally healthy. So mm -hmm. if I got a wild hair up my ass, I probably could pull off a decent showing or something. But my mindset won't allow me to want to do that anymore. I'm doing, you know, I, I got put on the scientific board of my company. Um, I'm creating stories every day, helping people heal themselves from, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And like I said, you heard me say heal themselves. I'm not. All I'm doing is kind of showing them the way, opening the door, shining the light, and um, you know, helping helping uh, create products, and you know, I do a lot of coaching, um, stuff like that. So, you know, I'm living a very fulfilled life. I, I, I basically, um, my wife got diagnosed with cancer in, at the end of 2018, oh, wow. and so all the stuff that I went through to heal myself you know I, we used it to heal her and so she got a clean bill of health awesome early earlier this year but awesome. i literally did everything you know as a bodybuilder you know we don't leave a stone unturned when it comes to getting the goal that we you know we were trying to set up and my goal was to help heal my wife you know you know what i'm saying like and uh i've seen so, i saw some miracles man yeah I saw some miracles and i saw a bunch of crazy stuff that you don't you won't never see until you get faced with those kind of decisions that you got to make. It's crazy, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I kind of like, you know, now I want to put myself in a position to where I can kind of reach out or, or make myself available to people who are going to face a lot of the stuff uh -huh. that I faced, you know, um, father time gets us all. So, and that's why I tell these young bucks, you know, I love bodybuilding, but you can't, you're not in control. You cannot manipulate the situation you know what i'm saying not right. like we think we can anyway so we we sometimes we get a god complex because imagine being able to you know put on 30 40 50 pounds of muscle in the same calendar year that'll that'll fuck with your head a little bit you know what i'm saying yeah, especially quality. Mm -hmm. 
especially quality. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I got some, and, and you you pull up the pictures, but I, I mean, we did some. It's, there's a lot of incredible physiques, and you follow mm-hmm. everybody's story. Most of us, you know, were skinny kids. Um, you know, who mm-hmm. had a little bit of drive or whatever. And mm-hmm. um, we stuck, you know, we were able to stick with it long enough to realize our potential. Um, yeah. You know, now, because you have the internet and because <clears throat> you can get the the cliff notes on how it's done, and then you have the resources to, you know, try to, try to make the experiment real. Mm-hmm. Well, m- most of these physiques that you s- see and admire was built in a furnace. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, we done been through some, you know, high mm-hmm. intensity workouts. I, you don't see that doesn't even make it to the internet. You know what I'm yeah. saying? The, the throw up workouts and you know what I'm saying? Like we see, they show we sh- they show you the. Glamorous you don't see stuff. anybody throwing up in the gym anymore. Yeah, they show you the glamorous yeah. stuff on yeah. the internet. I'm talking about the stuff we used to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know what yeah. I mean? Like mm-hmm. throwing up and yeah, and, and you know those insane drop sets and mm-hmm. you, know, you just. You don't see too much of that no more. So. No. They got a machine for every angle, for every muscle now, you know. Yeah. Back in the day, we, we didn't have that, so. Um, one last I question. Was lo- I was about. lucky to experience both. And so that's how I can speak from a perspective of I was there then and I was there, you know, then. So I can kind of yeah. I, I can bear witness to both. I meant to ask you this before. What was your, what was your favorite country that you could competed or visited? I love Australia, and believe it or not, I love Sweden too. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna bring up Sweden. <laughs> I, I actually love Sweden. I, to be yeah. honest with you, bro, um, that was that was crazy when I read that. I'm like, I can't believe they did. Yeah, that. but you know, if you get the real story, it's like, you gotta understand, like, so the story that you guys got was kind of like a shock to me. I was like, really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But how it really went down was, you know, like, no big deal. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like. I, I don't know if you, I, you got to tell you the story, but I was doing an appearance. I had four scheduled mm-hmm. and, you know, they had put posters up, gas, uh, gas invited me over there. So mm-hmm. anyway, I go to the first one and it's in uh, Sundsvall, Sweden, right? And so I check into my hotel, I go to Gold's Gym and they were looking at me crazy then, but I didn't put two and two together. Mm-hmm. And I go to the event and it's a store signing. So they, it's a store and it's like 65, 70 people in a supplement store all around the walls and all that. And got the table set up. So I'm, you know, I'm there, you know, shaking hands, kissing babies, signing autographs. All of a sudden these two cops come in, one stops at the door, one comes and stands next to me. I'm already shaking somebody's hand. So I finished with him. I turn around and shake the cop's hand. I'm, you know, ready, looking for the cameraman. <laughs> He's like, Mr. Freeman, you need to come with me. And I was just like, for what? And he was like, we suspect that you'll use antibiotic steroids. And I was just like, yeah. And he was like, I, he said, please, let's not do this here. I want to take you and ask you some questions. And so at that moment, I'm just like, this has to be a joke. I mean, like, I mean, I don't have any steroids on me. You know mm-hmm. It's like you're a pro bodybuilder. What do you, you think, know, though, man? He was like, so, so, so now I'm tripping. So I'm looking for Ashton Kusher to jump, you know, because I'm in Sweden. I'm thinking somebody going to come out the back. And so they didn't. So he's like, no, you need to come with me. He said, the station is only a few minutes away and you'll be back, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, whatever. So I grab my stuff and I'm walking out and all of a sudden the paparazzi's out there. They're shaking all the pictures. And I'm just like, I'm so green, bro. I don't even, I don't even really still, still don't think nothing. They put me in the cop car. We ride down the road. So did they handcuff you? No. No, no. Okay. so okay. that's when I knew everything was cool because <laughs> yeah. a 300 pound black man in Sweden, if he's under arrest, he's definitely gonna have on handcuffs. You know what I'm saying? One hundred percent of the time. So when they didn't handcuff me, I knew I was like, well, this ain't really nothing. Whatever. I mean, so I go to the police station, and so they start telling me about how their laws are over there. If you have dreads, if you have too many tattoos, too many piercings. They could just stop you and, and ask you to pee in a cup. And then if you pass it's dirty, they can go search your house. And that's how they roll. That's how they do stuff. Wow. And so me, I'm just being me. So the guy was like, you know, would you mind taking a urinalysis? I was like, yes, I got to piss right now. Give me the cup. So I go pee in the cup and I come back out and they, he run off and test it. And then he says, um, he says, it came back positive for, for cannabis. I was like, yes, I just flew in from Amsterdam. I had a five over layover. What would you do? Huh? I'm like, I don't even feel like I needed to explain myself on that one. And then, um, and so 
Then they asked me a couple more questions. And so after that, because the questions was kind of dumb. So I was like, hold up. Play. I said, what is this really about? I said, why are you even bothering me right now? And he said, he started telling me about um, somebody who got arrested. I just spilled something on my desk. Uh-huh. Somebody got arrested in Sweden. Uh, what's it? Martin Schilstrom. Martin. Um, remember Martin? Big Martin. Mm. But anyway, Martin got arrested in, yeah. in Sweden and he gave them a hard time. And so they were trying to build a case against him. And so anybody who came through Sweden, they would harass. And so we were supposed to go to Gothenburg uh, a week later for an event. And they were going to basically do the same thing they did to me, to Jay Cutler and Dennis James and Dennis Wolf and all those guys that was coming. So after I got out of the police station, I went back to the, to the, um, to the store to get my stuff. And everyone was still in the store. I'm like, what are y'all? Why are y'all still here? And they was like, oh, we knew you was coming back. This all this this happens all the time. I'm like, what? You mean to tell me y'all invite people over and don't tell them that you know the police gonna come and knock him? So anyway, I I went back to the hotel and my manager called me and told me that it's all over the internet that I got arrested in Sweden. I'm just like, what do you mean? I'm in my hotel chilling. Mm-hmm. He was like, Well, you need to pack up and come on home because they plan on doing this at all the rest of your stops. And they plan on doing it to everyone who goes to Gothenburg next week. So I was like, well, let me call Jay and them and tell them not to come. And so that's what I did. Yeah. So that's the real Sweden yeah. story. Now, the, the, some of the people still went to Gothenburg and they got harassed. They got the harassed. Wow. Strongman team and all that. They still like that today or you don't know? Um, I don't know. I heard they were. Yeah. I haven't been, you know, I went over there one more time. Um, I actually interviewed uh, Jean-Pierre. I should ask him. He's from there, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, there's some crazy stuff out there. You know, it's the opposite of going to Kuwait or yeah. um, or going to Amsterdam. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's a totally different mindset. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, that was my question. I wasn't going to bring up Sweden. I knew that probably. No, to be honest with you, bro, I have no... <laughs> it's actually kind of funny, I guess, if you think about it. it it's comedy to me. Yeah. And honestly, now it is. My, my now. popularity and my fame went through the roof after that. You know, because a lot of people who didn't know who I was from Adam. Oh, yeah. And that's the point. So the guy, the police officer said, I don't think it's right that these companies hire you guys to promote their products because it makes the young got people, kids want to be like you. And I said, that may be true. But when you harass people like me and arrest me, you're defeating your purpose. You know what I'm saying? Like when they see that you you did this to me because because I'm big, no, for no other reason. Um, then that's going to go against what you're trying to accomplish, you know? And so I asked him, I said, how old are you, bro? And he was like, 47. I said, you might need to go get your testosterone checked because you acting like a bitch right now. And his partner <laughs> bust out laughing. But I, like I said, after he told me his, his agenda, I was just like, why would you waste the taxpayer's money for this dumb shit? Yeah, I mean, it's just dumb. So what would they have done if you would have refused? Would they have deported you? They would have kicked you out? Oh, I mean, to be honest with you, you got to understand, I was leaving my flight. I would have been, I was on the next flight anyway. But I'm just wondering if, because they can't, nothing. If, if, hold, they got to hold you down and take your blood or, or what? No, he was, oh, no, 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 no. He was just trying to, to just, you know, say that all bodybuilders take steroids, see, yeah. I told, you know, all that type of stuff. He was just trying to paint a negative picture yeah, yeah. on us in general. He didn't even really care. And, and like I say, it backfired because like, people who would have never known I exist are following now. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so it helped you out. It, it helped me out a lot, to be honest, especially since I called all the other guys and say, because they was, you know, Jay had, these, these things, these, that event was huge. And so that would have been very embarrassing to those guys to come over and get done like that. I wasn't really that embarrassed. Sons of all, let me tell you how small Sons of all is. So the airplane lands, right? Mm-hmm. So the airplanes land, so they put on brakes, then they back up, then they pull it to the spot. Wow. That's, that's the airport. Wow. That's it. <laughs> so that's how small Sands Ball is. Mm. And I wasn't really worried. The, the, the crazy thing is, like I say, they had planned on the media being at all the spots and they were going to try to, you know, paparazzi or arrest me or do whatever you, whatever they called it. They, they were just trying to build up um publicity which mm-hmm. what i told the guys i said your strategy is flawed because i'm coming a week early 
So now, and I told him, I said, I'm about to go call everybody and tell them not to come. So now all that money that you spent and all those plans that you had is not going to, it's going to be for naught. Yeah. So the strongman team still went, but that's the only ones that got harassed. Yeah. Wow. Praise well, Mr. Tony. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you coming on, man. We finally got to, got to do this. Yep. So are you going to the Arnold and the Olympia? This year? I'm going to the Olympia because it's right down the road from where I live. I'm not going to the Arnold. Okay. So, yeah. Are you going or? I plan to. Yeah. No, I'll definitely I, be at the I, Olympia. I'm still a fan. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've been going. I, I missed one year. What's your prediction? I, I guess I missed last year, but I had went a couple of years, you know, the two years prior to that. Um, I was there when Sean won. I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I'll have to uh, coordinate. If you come to the Olympia, we'll have to meet up for sure. Oh, of course. I'm, you know, yeah. what, what's your I'm still uh, a fan and I'm still in the game. I'm just, you know, I'm like the old dude who I, when I was still competing, and one of the reasons why I spoke up about, you know, how it should go mm-hmm. is because I, I wanted to still be a fan. I wanted to still be able to, to enjoy mm-hmm. the sport. <laughs> and if you notice some of the st- some of the things that I was so-called bitching about, uh, they're actually implementing, you know, mm-hmm. so. I'm like, I'm flattered in one, on one hand. And just, mm-hmm. again, it makes it more entertaining. You know, now they go from worst to first, where before the, the first call out, the show's over. But now we got to sit up here and watch everybody else. Mm-hmm. So now they do it the opposite way. And that's so much more entertaining. I feel sorry for the people who win in, but you about to take home the money. You should work harder. <laughs> yeah. I got a, real, a funny story real quick. I uh, Ian Harrison, I, I'm sure you know him. He, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's on one of my – I do a Thursday night show, and he's my regular – um he was telling me a funny story about him and uh, ron love okay and, uh, him and ron uh, a couple years ago they met at the olympia and, and uh ian said uh to ron uh i don't recognize anybody here and ron says back to him don't worry they don't recognize us either oh wow That's <laughs> this is true yeah this is true i you know yeah. i don't know i'm it's still i'm still it ain't been that long for me yet and plus i, yeah. I still kind of stay in a little bit but um mm-hmm. Yeah, most people have no. I mean, Ron Love and Ian both were insane physiques, bro. X frames. Yeah. You know, and I guess they weren't 300 pounds, but they looked every bit of it back then. So, yeah. I, was it yeah. the photography that made everybody look like that? I don't know. I mean, Ian, Ian had, I think Ian said he was about 270, 280, he told yeah. me when he competed. Yeah. So, yeah. he, Paul Dillette was like 285. Yeah. And Paul was kind of how was Paul tall? Yeah, Paul's uh six four. Six yeah. Three. So yeah. he was 285. I mean, he looked every bit of yeah. 310, 315. I remember he guest posed at the junior national that year. He was like 284, 287. I was just like, yeah. Oh my God. I came in. So with the first, you know, Dorian was the first person mm-hmm. that we saw with any kind of shape at 300, but um, mm-hmm. besides uh Victor Richards. And I don't even know if he got to 300. Yeah. Uh real quick before I let you go. Do you think Rami's going to take it again? Well, I'd like to see Sean come back and push him. I'd like to see what Roley looks like against him. I'd like to see he Sean, has, but he Sean, has Sean hasn't tools. made his announcement yet. So. He has the tools. Um, I've been a big Rami fan since day one, and um, his legs bother me a little bit. I'd like to see something i don't even know what you could do about that but um they're just so big yeah i'm I'm, brandon went for conditioning i think if brandon had showed up like he was looking um you know before the show before the pill before the water pill Mm -hmm. it would have been you know and i think that um um what's what's my what's my guy's name i think phil says he's coming right say that again I think Phil said he's coming back again. Well, uh, again, if Phil's waist is tight, he's hard to beat. I mean, every, now that's the, everybody's looking at it now. So, yeah. you know, I remember back in the day when I said, don't try to put an eight-bedroom house on a four-bedroom frame. That's what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I was saying. You know, we only have – we can only hold so much. And then after that, it, it just doesn't look right. So – that was his, that's been everybody's demise. That's been everybody. That was Ronnie's, that was Dorian's. Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody's demise is when you, when you blow up the balloon so big that it doesn't get hard anymore, or you blow up the, push the envelope so much that, you know, you got to get out the duct tape. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. 
So um, I agree. I think, I think Rami can do it, but I think if Sean came back with some improvements, they would have, they have a decision to make. Um, I think Roley has a chance with some improvements. Um, at, but it, it, can you improve at this? You know, they're all to the point where they're, you know, we all get to that point where we're just trying to be as good as we was last time. You know what I'm saying? Improvement. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of, I'm trying to think who can really improve. I think Hadi, um, you know, that what about, what about, night, uh, what about Kai? Think he's going to come? Uh, if Kai came in all the way tight, they would have a hard time. Now, I'm not saying Kai would win. I, he would win in my book, book probably, but because um, you got to understand, Kai, if Kai comes back and he nails his conditioning, he's going to put on a show and they miss him so much. And Kai's already been on ESPN. Kai's done more not being Mr. Olympia than any Mr. Olympia has as far as being out in the public eye. I mean, bro, he, had, he was on, I mean, Monday Night Football. Come on, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's been in a couple of movies. So he's mm -hmm. a great candidate to make bodybuilding popular in a way that it should be. Right. You know, having the title and putting it in your briefcase and taking it home somewhere and not really, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like our sport was on a rocket ship back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. We should be way, way, way past where we are with all the technology and, you know, all that stuff. So um, somebody like Kai would actually bring the right kind of light. And I'm not saying none of the other Olympias or shy in the wrong light, but I'm saying like he already, he's, he's done it. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like if he was Mr. O, then he might be doing Monday Night Football. Imagine Mr. Olympia doing Monday Night Football. Mm -hmm. He did it without being Mr. O. Imagine what that would do for our sport. The, the flashlight might get a little too big. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Yeah. But, now, um, now let me ask you another question. Do you think he's entitled to a special invite? Well, if you just base it on how many people has gotten special invites, then yes. I'd like to see him qualify first mm -hmm. just so he can knock the dust off, knock, knock the rust off. <laughs> Not that he was beneath. He should be able to just go straight up there as far as, you know, because Rami got to invite. I mean, not saying who is big Rami, but I'm saying yeah, what, what yeah. did they base his invite on? Yeah, that's a popular question right now. Everybody yeah. keeps wondering. If what did they compete. base his invite yeah. on? Yeah. Just because he was big? Yeah. Or Rami? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, to me, and to be honest with you, I can say all this stuff now because I'm way over here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, somebody has to pay for the Mr. Olympia. So do I, do I need to add anything to that? No, no, no. Oh, you got to okay. sell tickets. Yeah. All right. No, yeah. So, you know, yeah. I get it. So you do what you got to do to put the butts in the seat. I got you. Mm -hmm. but so, yes, you should invite Kai and you should let Sean come back no matter what, because obviously Sean is not guilty. I'm not saying he has to go through the process, but again, yeah. a, a 280 pound black man, uh, you, you feel me? Like if it was any kind of real guilt, then we would kind of know it by now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, when I first heard it, you got to understand, because I've been through the mill. When I first heard it, I'm just like, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. and it was obvious of what it was all about. So, and that was mission accomplished. But, you know, it's been a couple of years now. Um, the man's not getting no younger. The crazy thing is he still looks like he could do it. So if he, he looks just, crazy, he looks crazy. He, look, he still looks like he can do it. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to sell some tickets, send Kai and Sean an invite. Oh man, that'd be crazy. You know what I'm saying? And then um then you might have to actually have something. So I mean, who am I? But like I say, I would love to see it. You know, I I'll get my popcorn out to see it. Oh yeah. Um yeah. you know, but I know that would be motivation for the other guys. And you know, hell, I think you could probably bump the prize money up another hundred grand. Um, I would divide it up a little better though. Yeah. You gotta understand it's hard to do this. Mm -hmm. And um and and there's really not a whole lot of unless you're unless you're maximizing your own brand or monetizing your own brand, it, you ain't making, it's hard to make money in this game. Now yeah. I'm saying all you have is the shows and, co and COVID is putting that in jeopardy. The sponsors, you know, they don't really have the ability to do what they want to do anymore because of all this stuff. So um, I think they should spread the money out a little more evenly and up to Annie. I agree. I agree. All right, Mr. Tony Freeman. Thank you for your oh, time. Yeah. And work on the lighting so it matches reality. Oh, did I say that? No, no I'm sorry. No. I agree. <laughs>
<laughs> I thought you were talking to me for a second. I was like, oh, man, I just, well, I'm got, just saying, like, I just those got new things, lighting in here. What are you talking those about? Things, <laughs> those things, because you got to understand, bodybuilding is, is all visual. There's no offsides or penalty. You know what I'm saying? It's all visual. So if the lighting is not right, then you're not getting to really participate. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the root word of fan, a fan is, fan, you know, fan is the root word of fanatic. You know, people that follow this, they know everything about it. So we have expectations of what it's supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes us, you know, participate. That's what makes us spend 750 bucks on the VIP package for the Olympia. Crazy. Because we want to see what it really looks like. So the people that's in the audience on TV or watching on the internet, if you take a little more time to, to improve the lighting, shoot that'll double and triple as well. Then you can pay more money and you'll just keep perpetuating until it's like all other sports. They need, you know what they need to do? They need to find out how the WWE does it because their lighting and and their, and their music is perfect. That's what I just, that's what, but I just explained it. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to want to create the best experience for Mm -hmm. the fans Mm -hmm. and the athletes if that's if that's your goal, not how much money I'm gonna make. If that's your goal, then that's what'll happen, mm-hmm. and then your money will multiply because of that. Yeah, yeah. bodybuilding used to be on television every single day, not like at nine o'clock at night or ten at noon, every day, yeah, every day. So can't tell me that you know the crowd, the people don't want it or whatever. It's how it's being presented. Yeah, true. All right, Mr. Tony, thank you again. Thank you, sir. Glad we finally got to get it together. Yeah, yeah, right. definitely. Uh, we'll have to do another one for sure. Anytime, let me know. Awesome. I'm going to have me a little cool background like that next time. All right, well, let me know. I can uh, I can hook you up with my sources. Excellent. Sounds All right. Great. All right, we'll All talk right, to you, you soon. All right, cool. All right.